Thank you, choir, for leading us in worship. Thank you, Luke, for leading us as well. As uh, you prepare to go off to school, we will miss your singing. But we'll have you sing again when you're home. Uh, Verses 12, 13, and 14. Uh, go-to text for me for wedding sermons for about 25 years. Um, And for two reasons. One, there's the clothing imagery. Uh, If you're married or if you've ever been a part of planning a wedding, my guess is you pay just a tad little bit of attention to the clothing that the bride and the groom and the groomsmen and the bridesmaids and the family, the wedding party will wear. Is that, am I right in guessing that? We do pay a little bit of attention to what we wear for weddings. And so it's a delight to take the clothing image of verse 12 and verse 14 and say to the happy couple and their families, you look marvelous, you look wonderful, well done in the clothing choices that you have made for this special event. And then to say, with all of the work that you have put into the apparel for this occasion, remember, it's even more important to work even harder to clothe yourselves each day of your married life, each day of our lives, with compassion and kindness and humility and meekness and patience and above all Love. And then there's verse 13, the image of bearing with one another. It is a delight to be able to inform couples about to enter into marriage that if they haven't already on that particular day, by the end of the day, husband will have a complaint against wife, wife will have a complaint against husband. Are there any married couples here where wife has never had a complaint against husband or husband has never had a complaint against wife? Is that possible? Does it ever happen? Of course not. So what Paul does in this passage is assume that we, all of us, will live in such a way that someone, many people, consistently will have complaints against us. He just assumes that, and he assumes that we will have complaints against each other. It's it's an assumption made for marriage And it is an assumption made for the church. That's the context of this passage. He's talking about the church. And so in church, we are to clothe, not just in this building, but in the body of Christ as we live together, we are to clothe ourselves with these things so that we can live faithfully with each other in some mysterious way beyond our ability to understand in this life, God has chosen to further the redemptive purposes of Jesus in the world through us, through local churches like ours in the power of the Holy Spirit, which then means that this call to clothe ourselves with patience and kindness and these other items is crucial for us to fulfill our created purpose as a family as a church. But then there's this awareness, this assumption, this truth that we will always fall short as much as we try to clothe ourselves with patience. We will always try each other's patience. And in the church, we are to bear with one another. We are to forgive each other. Billy Graham was fond of saying, if you find the perfect church, by all means, join it quickly. Just know that as soon as you join it, it will no longer be a perfect church church. And so this incredible call, this incredible privilege for each other to clothe ourselves with compassion and kindness and humility and meekness and patience and love. In one sense, it's a heavy burden. That's a heavy piece. That's a heavy wardrobe that we are called to bear. How can we possibly fit as Jacob had fit upon him moments ago, these these clothing items that are so vital, so important to not only our health as individuals, but to the health of our church. And how can we possibly, with the long list of complaints that people have against each of us and that we have against each other, how can we bear with one another over the long haul? The good news is that Jesus has already done these things for us, and we're simply participating in the life of Christ as the Holy Spirit clothes us with the clothing of Jesus. Jesus fully embodied, he was fully clothed in his earthly life at all times, fully clothed in compassion and patience 
and love. And the moment you and I trust Jesus by faith, Jesus through the Holy Spirit fills our spiritual closet with this wardrobe. And, and this wardrobe is not something that we put together of our own making. It's not something that we order online or buy at the store. It is a closet that is stocked by Jesus alone. And our calling, our invitation is to put on these items of clothing each day through the Holy Spirit. Jesus will not force us into these clothes, but invites us to ask the Holy Spirit as we begin each day, clothe me with patience, Lord. You've filled my closet with the apparel of compassion. Fit it on me today. I open myself to you that you may fill me with kindness, clothe me with kindness, that your kindness might flow from me to all that I will see today. We can clothe ourselves with these things because Jesus was clothed with these things and he has filled our spiritual closet with all of these characteristics. And then there's the bearing with one another. How can we possibly do that? We do that because for 2,000 years, God has been bearing with the inconsistencies and imperfections and sins of the church. And for 150 years, God has been bearing with our inconsistencies, along with celebrating our faithfulness, but bearing with our inconsistencies and our sins in the way that we've failed to be who we've called to be. And for as long as you've been alive, God has been bearing with us. As long as I've been alive, God has been bearing with us in patience and kindness and love and forgiveness. Ponder that for just a moment. I don't know about you, but I get frustrated at times with my own self, thinking that I should be farther along, we should be farther along in this journey toward being like Jesus. And verse 13 reminds us that God bears with us in our slowness, in our crankiness, in our resistance, in our resentment, in our failure to be all that we want to be and that we know God wants us to be. We can bear with one another because God, through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit, bears with us. And by the Holy Spirit, we can bear with one another in marriage, in family, in church, in the community. And then, of course, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you. That's the easiest one to understand. We can forgive others as they trespass against us only because we know that we in Christ have been forgiven of our sins. To the extent that we become aware that we are able to embrace our sinfulness and the forgiveness that Jesus has won for us on the cross, to that extent we are able to forgive one another, to forgive those with whom we have a complaint. We don't minimize the pain or the hurt or the damage caused by sin. We don't wink at each other's sin and say, it's okay, it's no big deal. We forgive as the Lord forgave us and the Lord forgave us by dying on a cross. Forgiveness takes sin very seriously. It calls for repentance from the sinner and it calls for the sinner to right the wrongs caused by their sin. And it calls for the community to restore the one into fellowship and into partnership in the work of God. The Babimba tribe of South Africa has a very unique way of restoring people when they've fallen short of the values of the tribe or they've hurt the tribe in some way. They gather the offender in a circle in the village. They stop all work, all activity, and they gather around the offender in a circle. And instead of throwing stones, they offer compliments and praise. They praise the person for their wonderful good characteristics. They thank the person as they recount positive experiences with the person. And this can go on for quite some time. And in the course of being built up, the person comes to the place of acknowledging the ways in which they've harmed the life of the tribe and repenting. And in the celebration of the person and in the confession and the repentance, the person is restored into the life of the tribe 
and welcomed as a partner in the work of the tribe. This forgiveness is not something that God simply endures because we're always sinners. This bearing with us is not something that God endures. Instead, it's for the purpose of restoring us. It's not that we are to endure being with someone for years in our church that we don't particularly get along with. That's not bearing with each other. Bearing with each other and forgiving each other is seeking to be reconciled and seeking to lift up the person so that they and we can be all that God called us to be as individuals and so that the life of the church, the strength of the church is furthered. Bear with one another and forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you. Verse 13 assumes that we'll bring our faults to church, that we will offend each other and that we'll need to forgive each other. And then verse 14 says that love binds everything together in perfect harmony. At first glance, it's a contradiction. How is there perfect harmony in a place where you're consistently having to forgive and bear with each other? We solve the contradiction by seeing that the love that binds everything in perfect harmony is not our love. It's not our ability to love. It's Jesus' love for us. Make the connection between verse uh, 14 and chapter 1, verse 17, which says, in Jesus, all things hold together. In Jesus' love, all things are bound together. And when we clothe ourselves in his love, when we ask the Holy Spirit to take the love of Jesus' clothing out of our closet, fit it upon us as the day begins, then we imperfectly begin to experience and embrace and further the perfect harmony that comes from the love of Christ. And then verse 15, let the peace of Christ, the peace that comes from Christ, rule in your hearts to which we are called in the one body. When we follow Jesus by faith and trust, we become members of one body. We become sister, brother to each other, part of one family. We automatically receive a world of family members, all who follow Jesus, past, present, and future. And we are bound together in a bond that's stronger than any other earthly bond. Jesus makes all his followers one. And again, when we clothe ourselves with compassion and love, that's when, when we bear with one another, that's when we begin to experience just a taste of the oneness of the family that Jesus has made in us. And within that family, we need to Experience the peace of Christ, the rule of the peace of Christ in our hearts. The word rule in this context means to settle disputes, to keep the peace, to establish order. The image is that of a referee, of an umpire in a sporting event. In the same way that the, 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 the referee keeps the game being played in the way that it's supposed to be played within the boundaries of the rules, the peace of Christ keeps us functioning well together in the life of of the church. The peace of Christ in this context is much, much more than that inner sense of peace that we all long for. Instead, it is personified as an active force in the life of the church through the Holy Spirit that holds us together, that keeps us focused, that keeps us within the bounds of Christ's love. And so as verse 16 says, we let the Word of Christ dwell richly within us. We're thankful we sing songs in worship as the peace of Christ guides us and as the peace of Christ holds us together. In verse 17, we do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether within the churches, uh, the walls of the church or outside these walls where we work and go to school and live, knowing that the peace of Christ is guiding us and lighting our way as we follow where Jesus leads through the Holy Spirit. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which you have been called in the one body. And there's where I want us to land today, the one body, this sense that we are one in Christ, that we are part of a family. Again, this bearing with one another, wearing the clothing that Jesus gives us, it is about strengthening our fellowship, our joy in being together, 
And it is about strengthening our church so that we can reach out, so that we can help people meet Jesus, so that we can love our hurting world and further the redemptive purposes of Jesus in our community. Anybody like grits? I grew up in the South. I did not uh, develop that wonderful taste for grits until I was a young adult and I have made up for lost time. Shrimp and grits, anyone? Cheese grits? Any kind of grits? That's what I love to eat. But here's the thing with grits. They do not come by themselves, right? Has anybody ever gotten up from the table, gone for a refill at breakfast and said, there's one more grit left. Anybody want it? Have you, have you ever said that? Parents, have you ever said to your children, if you don't eat that last grit, you're not going to get up from the table? No, we don't do it. It's always plural. It's always grits. And it's always plural in the church. It's always Christians. It's always us. Never just about me. Never just about you. It's about what God wants to do in us. Now, we as individuals get in on it. We as individuals become more like Jesus. It's what we're called to do. We as individuals grow. We as individuals experience joy. Yes, all of that is true. But all of that takes place within the context of us. The Spirit is at work in us. Not just so that we as individuals can be all that we can be, but so that the redemptive purposes of Jesus are furthered in us and through us. And people come to know Jesus outside these walls. And the kingdom of God is furthered in the tri-state area. And the glory of God is revealed because a bunch of folks at a place called Fifth Avenue Baptist make the commitment every morning to say, Holy Spirit, clothe me and clothe us in compassion and humility, and kindness, and meekness, and patience, and love. And as Jesus binds us together in this fellowship, the world gets a picture, a glimpse of the way Jesus holds everything together. And as Jesus has his way with us as we fulfill his dream, the glory of God is furthered. The kingdom of God is seen, it is furthered on earth as it is in heaven. So, sisters and brothers, here the bad news. We've got a lot of complaints against each other. Don't deny it. Don't run from it. Be real about it. Hear the good news. God bears with us, and because God bears with us, we can bear with one another. And through the Holy Spirit, the love and the compassion that is of Jesus can clothe us and the peace of Christ can guide us all to the glory of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Lord, for bearing with us in all the ways that we fall short of your dream for us. Thank you for saving us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Thank you for your hard-to-understand choice to further your redemptive purposes through people like us. Clothe us 
with the compassion and humility and meekness and kindness and patience and love of Jesus that we may not only bear with one another and forgive each other and that we may not only let the peace of Christ and the word of Christ dwell within us, but that we may do everything in the name of Jesus Christ so that you receive glory and your purposes are furthered. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.